Welcome again to Vertical Church Online. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. So thank you for being here. If you're new, just type new in the comments below and we'd love to get to know you better and follow up with you there. Also, uh, just so everybody is aware, we're going to be having an after party on the weeks of June 21st and June 28th at City Park in Chesapeake. We'll start at 1130 bring your chairs and bring a lunch of your own. Uh, we will not be doing potluck. We will not be sharing food. Um, we want to follow all of the guidelines. So be sure to join us then. Again, that's June 21st and June 28th at 1130. We're going to be having a family Zoom meeting uh, again on June 22nd. This is uh, next Monday, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about some things that have been going on here in Vertical Church and update everybody on uh, any new information that we have. Also, we're going to be launching our summer small groups in July, so you want to stay tuned for more information about that. If you're interested in hosting a small group, we have tons of resources, or if you have a resource that you would like to lead a small group about, just let us know and touch base with us about that, and we'll tell you all the things you need to know to get started. If you're giving this morning, thank you so much for your contribution. You are what keeps Vertical Church uh, thriving every week online and reaching so many people. If you'd like to give online, uh, you can text to give. Uh, just text 84321 and follow the directions after that. Or if you want to give online to vcgive.tv, you can give there. Or if you want to give through the mail, we have a P.O. box uh, that you can give as well. Just contact us about that information and we'll get that to you. So now we're going to go into our coffee break and we'll get ready for this morning's message. to get into uh, our message today. We're in part three of our series called Reset, Back to the Basics. And we've gone back to the book of Acts. We're reading through the book of Acts together as a church. Uh, and we've gone back to the book of Acts to really discover the, 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 the main idea of what it means to be church and the outcome that we're shooting for here. In more than anything else, more than knowledge about the book of Acts, more than all the facts of Acts, is that we want to be a church marked by the presence of God. We want to be like these disciples. When people look at us, they're like, man, these people have been with Jesus. 
And here's the deal. Like I recognize this moment in our culture, the moment that we're in right now in our country. Uh, the racial tension is, is, is probably the highest that it's been in several decades. Uh, at least probably in my lifetime, this is the uh, more people are calling for change than probably at any point in the last uh, 40 years. And as a, as a church, the temptation uh, is to abandon our opportunity to speak into the moment uh, because it's uncomfortable or because we're afraid that we'll say the wrong thing or because we don't know, you know what to say or what, what side to choose as if there's just like two sides and we have to be this or that. Um, and so the temptation that, that the church community can face, and our church in particular, but, but the church global, is to abandon this opportunity to speak into our culture. And I think it's not a coincidence that our church is in the book of Acts during this moment because I believe more than anywhere else, the book of Acts addresses this issue in real time. There are several points, you know, Paul will talk about we're neither slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, all of those things. But in real time, in narrative, like a story, I think the, I think the book of Acts has an incredible message for this moment in our uh, culture. So let's do this. I know last week we were in Acts 2. We're going to fast forward to Acts chapter 6. If you have a Bible, Acts chapter 6. And then next week we're going to we're going to rewind to get Acts 3 and 4 because that is one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture. But I thought this week it was best if we go ahead and, and address kind of the moment that we're in, and Acts does a great job doing that. So Acts chapter 6, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Then I'm going to, I'm going to give you just a couple of thoughts, and then we're going to break to an interview that Pastor Matt Keller did with Pastor Miles McPherson, and it is an incredible interview. Please don't check out. Please pay it like this is incredible wisdom that comes from Pastor Miles that you're going to, we're, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to receive here in just a few minutes. But first, let me read the passage, give us a couple thoughts into the interview, and then we'll, we'll jump into it. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews, and what that means is the Greek-speaking Jews, the Jews that were, weren't really like Hebrew as much as they were Greek. They had assimilated into the Greek culture. So let's call them the Greek Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews or the really Jewish Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose, look at this, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So, verse 7, the result of this, the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Today, this message I'm, I'm calling Hellenistic Jewish Widows Matter. <laughs> that's, that's today's message title. Hellenistic Jewish Widows Matter. So here's, let me, let me recap this passage for you. The church had been growing in leaps and bounds. It had gone from 120, then, then Pentecost happens, they explode to 3,000, then Acts 3 and 4 happen, they go to 5,000, and so as the number is increasing, what happens is growth brings pressure. Growth always brings pressure, and here the pressure comes to a head, much like today, among people of different ethnic groupings 
with one of them, the minority, questioning their relative status within the movement. Sound familiar? Okay, I told you, Acts addresses this issue perfectly. Here you have a group of people, men and women, who are asking the question, is there a place for us here? Do we belong here? And how ridiculous, come on, let's just Let's set aside our, our preconceived political agendas and ideologies. How ridiculous would it have been for the apostles when, when these people are coming up to him and saying, hey, hey, our, our widows, the, the Hellenistic Jewish widows, are being left out. Don't Hellenistic Jewish widows matter to the community? How ridiculous would it have been if the apostles had said, hey, wait a second, all Jewish widows matter. Well, Yes, of course, all Jewish widows matter, but right now it's the, it's the Hellenistic ones who are being left out of the distribution of food. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm not, I'm not try, I, just, I think that's important to recognize that the apostles didn't respond with like, well, all Jewish widows matter. They, they responded differently. I want you to notice the genius of the apostles here, that they, they saw that if there was a problem, if there was a problem about people from different ethnic backgrounds, that it only makes sense to include those people front and center in the work of making it right. That, that you have to hear from the people who are experiencing the injustice to have a full spectrum picture of what's actually happening. And I'm gonna prove it to you, did you notice? In Acts chapter 6, the seven people who were chosen to lead the ministry of distributing food to the widows, all seven were Greek names. Did, did you see that? Did, they weren't Hebrew names. Those aren't Hebrew men. Those are men from the Greek Hellenistic Jewish grouping. And, and, and it's the segment of church that the, the church that felt the discrimination, the apostles chose from that group to lead the ministry, to, to hear from their voice first and foremost. That's genius. You gotta see how, how brilliant and inspired by the Holy Spirit that decision is. Because in that moment, the church showed an awareness that leadership drawn from the oppressed does the best job of representing the interests of the oppressed. And here's what I want you to see. Remember we said we could abandon our voice to speak into this moment? Friends, this is our inheritance as Christian believers. This is part of our story. We, we who have been full, filled with the Holy Spirit, this is our opportunity. Rather than abandoning our voice to speak into culture, we need to reclaim our inheritance and lead out in the conversation. We need to lead out in how to address matters like this because from the very beginning, we've had to deal with, with issues like this. However, I will say this, just like the, just like the apostles decided to let those from the, to, to empower, not let, to empower those from the Hellenistic group to lead out, those of us who are, who are paler brown, let me just say this to us, those of us who have skin that looks like mine, maybe this is a moment we need to intentionally take the passenger seat. And we need, to, we need to empower and allow our brothers and sisters of, of different colors to drive the conversation. And we need to spend some time, like the apostles, hearing from the, 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 the group, the segment in our church that feels disenfranchised. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want us to transition to this incredible interview from Pastor Matt Keller, the, the leader of the Next Level Relational Network, also uh, one of the lead pastors at Next Level Church. He and his wife, Sarah Keller, they, they lead the church together. And he's interviewing Pastor Miles McPherson, the lead pastor from the Rock Church in San Diego. And this interview, y'all, as soon as I heard it, I thought, how in the world can I get this to our church? Because this 
is solid gold. So uh, it's about a 25 minute interview. So stay engaged, listen up because Pastor Miles is going to drop wisdom like crazy that we need to latch on to in this moment so that we can be part of the movement leading out the conversation rather than abandoning our voice in the moment. So let's switch to that interview and I'll see you right after that. Well, hey, everybody, super excited uh, to be having a conversation uh, with Miles McPherson, who pastors the Rock Church, San Diego, California, just an incredible leader, an incredible author, an incredible speaker, uh, an incredible son of, of our Heavenly Father. And so, Pastor Miles, great to be with you. Thank you so much for making the time for us today. I didn't know I was five Incredibles. Oh, bro, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I could get too. I stopped. Stop. That's a lot of pressure, brother. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Man, so, so here's the deal. Obviously, you know, your book, The Third Option, which is unbelievable. Go to Amazon, get it, everybody, everywhere. Give it to everyone. It's incredible. Miles, I learned so much from the book. Um, I, I, everyone I talk to, it, I've heard you speak on this whole idea of diversity and your story and just where our nation finds itself today and just the, the tension, the struggle. And um, man, I'm blown away and I'm, I've learned so much from you around this topic. And so uh, thank you and I'm excited. So, so talk about the book, talk about the why behind the what, why did you write it? Give us a little snippet of that. Yeah, there, there are so many whys, but I, I, I'll, I'll give you my latest one because you know, my, my upbringing was a why. And when I was eight years old, Martin Luther King was killed. And I remember what I felt and what I said to myself. And I was eight. I don't know, you know, so it was such an emotionally impacted event. I remember feeling like it wasn't fair because he was the voice and they just took him away. And I remember thinking, what do we do now? I remember those words. And so for my whole life, that's always been kind of like a cloud, like we've got to do something. And, you know, I, I have a, uh, all my grandparents are from Jamaica. I have two black great grand, grandfathers that are black. I have Chinese black grandmother and a white grandmother. And my white grandmother was sent to Jamaica, Queens from Jamaica, West Indies, so she went married black Jamaican. She ended up finding a black Jamaican in Jamaica, so he was double Jamaican. <laughs> he was double chocolate as well. And uh, she, he couldn't go in the front of her uh, house, in the front door. He had to go to the back door to her brother's house. And, and when she married him, they cut her off. So we never knew them, never met them. They lived 15 minutes away. We never heard anything about them. And, but I, and I grew up in a black neighborhood, went to school uh, in elementary school, junior high in, in a white neighborhood. So I got harassed in the white neighborhood for being black, got harassed in the black neighborhood for not being black enough. So this was my experience growing up. My white grandmother was family, so I didn't, I didn't it, it was very real to me how we got along here, but people didn't get along outside. And so I, I wrote the book, you know, fast forward many, many years later to give people tools on how to get along. I mean, we, we live in a us versus them culture. Everything's about what side are you on? You know, if you watch the news, the news is about what side are you on? They make money on our division. And uh, when you're in a conversation about race or politics or whatever, it's always what side you're on. So you're either us or them. Those are your two options. And if you pick one side, you're, you're always against the other side. The book, the third option is that we honor what we have in common and we have so much more in common than different. And so I wrote this book to help us understand how much we have in common, how to honor it, how to place prices value on it in this environment of racial division and give us tools on how to do that. Um, let's talk about some of the content of the book. In the book, Miles, you talk about in-group, out-group bias. Yeah. <laughs> Love that concept. Explain what you mean by that. And I think this is the key to this whole book. When I first started writing the book, I did not understand this concept. And this is what changed the whole book. All of us are in multiple groups. Guys are a group. Senior pastors are a group. Mega church pastors are a group. We're all in multiple groups. Females are a group. Moms are a group. That's your in-group. And we're in, we are in multiple groups. The people who aren't in any of those groups or, or even one group, is, is part of that group's out group. So, you know, as far as a, a mechanic, I'm an out group to a mechanic. I'm not a mechanic. And so you have your in group, and many of them, we're in many of them. And then you have the people who are in your out group. When you identify the people in your in group, you understand them. I understand being a senior pastor and a senior pastor of a mega church. I understand what that's about. Right. 
a senior pastor of a church of 100, there are things he doesn't understand about what we go through. So we understand things about people in, of our in-group. A, a, a woman who's a mother has information about motherhood that a, that a woman who's not a mother doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So once you identify your in-group, you understand things about your out-group, the people, I mean your in-group. The people of your out-group, a group we've never been in, you don't understand. You only have anecdotal information, rumor or stereotypes, and that's why we generalize, because we don't know. And so I don't know what it means to be Muslim. I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't know that there was 150 types of Muslims. And so if you don't know that, you make general statements based on ignorance. Once you identify your in-group, you give in-group bias, which means you give preferential treatment to the people in your in-group. Why? Because you feel more comfortable with them, you've been around them more often, you know them, you have better assumptions, positive assumptions, you have more grace, more patience. You assume you're going to get along. It's like if, 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 if I'm in San Diego, we don't have the San Diego Chargers anymore, but if you have a San Diego Charger fan and they meet another San Diego Charger fan, now it's LA, I get it. You automatically have that connection and you start, hey, you start talking about stuff you knew and you, you, you give them this benefit of the doubt. But if they were a Raider fan, boom, you cut conflict. Or you just have ignorance about them. And so, it's very important for us to understand this is a group. What you look like is a group. And what you don't look like is your out group. That means whatever you don't look like, guaranteed, unless you grew up with them and that was your social in group your whole life, you don't really understand who they are. And so we make a lot of generalizations or stereotypes about those people. And we give them less benefit of the doubt than the people who are in our group. We're less patient than the people within our group because that's your out group. We do that with every kind of in group, out group that we have. This just happens to be one of them. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that concept changes everything because you instantly see the world differently. And as soon as you have that self awareness that of, I, I only know my in group and mm -hmm. I have a bias to that, it just, it just is fact. It's, it's unbelievable, man. So I, I love that concept. And you know what I want to do, Matt, because I, I have a book here in front of me. I want to read that list because and this is the list of in-group bias. I am more comfortable. It's on page 23 of the book. I'm more comfortable with those like me, more inclined to spend time socially with those like me, more patient with those like me, give the benefit of the doubt quicker, express more grace when mistakes are made. It's easier to communicate. I assume I will get along easier. I'm more willing to go out of my way to help those like me and possess more positive assumptions. The opposite is true. I am less all those things. And that, whether you're racist or not, it feels like that when you get it. Matter of fact, probably the biggest aha I learned writing this is that you can be racially offensive without being a racist. And what I mean by that is obviously people are racist, no doubt, but sometimes we just express out-group discrimination, which is the opposite of in-group bias. With people we don't feel comfortable with, we don't know them, but to the person receiving it, they're, they're offended. Or you can say something out of ignorance or being nervous, and it doesn't mean you're trying to hurt somebody, you're just ignorant. Um, you don't know what you're even talking about, and it's racially offensive. And so you can be racially offensive without necessarily being a racist. Now, once you find out it's racially offensive, you got to change. Right. But a lot of times people can't separate being racially offensive from being racist. And because they can't separate those two things, if they're told they're racially offensive, because they don't want to be called a racist and don't believe they are, they will deny that they're racially offensive. Like saying, I don't see color. People will argue to the death to defend their right to say that because when someone says, well, that's offensive, they say, well, I'm not a racist, so that can't be offensive. Separate those two things and give yourself the opportunity to realize that there may be some things you do and say that are offensive that doesn't necessarily make you a racist unless you hear that and keep doing it to hurt somebody. And that's a different story. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the biggest takeaways for me. Again, learning so much from you, learning so much from the book, all of these concepts, that, that, that idea of you can be racially offensive. So what does somebody do 
it, it, the minute you find out you're racially, I mean, wh how, what do we do with that? It, because, and one of the things I think you and I have even laughed about this before is, is you use the phrase, I've heard you use the phrase white fragility. And when I think about me, I'm like, yeah, that probably describes me in a lot of ways. At least it certainly used to. I'm getting way better at it, Miles. But that idea, like, like I don't want to offend. And so, well, then I'd rather not talk about it or I pretend it right. doesn't exist. Like, talk about some of that. Yeah, you know, for people of color, race is a comfortable comment. We talk about it. We deal with it every day. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, racism was only a black thing. Or, or people of color issue it wasn't white people's issue because it, it was with the the people receiving it right and now that people are are white people have to deal with it in a different way it's uncomfortable it's new and it's easier not to talk about it especially when you feel as a white person you're the one always who's the wrong person mm -hmm. and so it's uncomfortable and it's talking about it um and, and that's it, it is what it is but um, so white fragility comes from the word fragile as this inability to handle racial stress. When you realize that you're doing something that is offensive, talk about it. I mean, if someone says to you, like we're going to talk about, don't say, don't see your color. Now we can talk about that here. You know, when you say you don't see color, what you're saying, what the person of color hears is that this doesn't matter to you, mm. that the burden and everything I experienced because of this, you don't want to talk about, you don't want to even acknowledge it. And when, matter of fact, when the first time someone said it to me, I thought they were colorblind. I thought they had astigmatism or something. Yeah. And then I said to them, you know, does that mean you see me as white like you? Because that's not true. That's not my experience. And so it's offensive to the person. It's like saying to a woman, I don't see you as a woman. Of course you do. You know, I don't see you as being from the South. Well, that's that. That's what you are, right? you're, or you're not really from China. And so it's kind of ignorance as well, because it's, you only say it when you see someone of color. And so if someone tells you that that's offensive to them, listen, give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe they're trying to tell it, help you, and then don't say it. And ask them, why is it offensive? What would be better to say? I'll just say you love them. I mean, because really the spirit behind it is, I want to treat everybody the same. Well, then say that. Right. I mean, it's really that simple, but you don't want to say, you don't want to um, uh, erase someone's culture, their experience, their pain, because every color has a pain. There's, there's a whole chapter in the book called Color Coded Pain. There's pain and burdens. White fragility is a white thing. That's, that's a real thing. It's, it's a real uncomfortableness you have. Okay, let's deal with that. By the way, white is a color. So, you know, in the world, you have white people and you have people of color. Those are your two options. To God, the third option is that everybody's got a different, is a different shade of brown. And so we're all <laughs> colored with the same thing, some to less agree than others. And so I think when you realize there's something that is offensive, learn and then adjust. Well, that was such a big takeaway for me because man, I, I'm telling you growing up in small town, rural Indiana, I was taught we don't see color like that is I was taught that and so I remember being in a meeting with you a couple of years ago and I, like hearing that from from you and some other people in the room and I'm like what like <laughs> I, I was taught that the most I could do to show you respect was to to act as if I don't see color and it was like what like that blew my mind so that's a huge concept for so many people yeah, and I think, you know, it, it, it's a difference between, it's a, it's a big difference. And I think what you were taught it, it, to defend the people who probably told you that, I probably believe that they were trying to tell you, don't discriminate on people who look different. That's great, but say that. Right. And I, and I know it kind of comes off to, you know, don't see color. And I, I get that, but the, the spirit of it is great. It's just a wording. And because... Uh, of how it's received and what the words are. Um, here's the thing, celebrate. God made this, yeah. right? This is not an accident, <laughs> and it's not a curse in the eyes of God. So let's celebrate the, the diversity of people. Um, and, and, you know, when, when, someone, when someone gets a tan, they want people to see it. <laughs> so when you get a tan in Hawaii, you want to celebrate it. But when someone gets a tan in the womb and they're born with a tan, you want to invalidate it. Let's celebrate what God made. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, and acknowledge it now. And also let me acknowledge the burden and understand the burden that it has and make sure that I um, can honor that. Man, I love that. And that has been, again, for my journey that I've been on, Miles, that has been such a huge piece of it for me is because I, I love to learn. So I love being able to sit down with someone. And now I feel empowered to because of your book to go and because of what I'm learning to go tell me your story. Because, man, your story is not like my story at all. I, I grew up in a county that was 97% white. Like it was, that was my experience. So just being able to not shy away from that, but to step into that and just go, tell me your story. Tell me what it was like to be mixed race. Tell me what it was like to grow up with whatever, like, because that's not my journey. So, so thank you, because I think you're, you're empowering people of all races and colors to step into the conversation instead of stepping away from the conversation. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So, so talk to me about racism. Um, you talk a lot about racism. And again, racism is such a buzzword. Unpack that, the different kinds of racism. Speak to, to some of that for us. Yeah, and <clears throat> truth be told, you know, this book, the third option is, is more about how to be honoring which is the third option, how to be honored versus how not to be racist. Those are two different things. <clears throat> so this is more empower me to actually do something versus avoid something. Right. But if I do it, I'm just by default, I'm not, I'm, I'm avoiding it. But really it's more about how do I be honoring? Jesus told us to love. He told us to love more than he told us not to hate. Mm -hmm. So um, there's three kinds of racism and some say four, but one is institutional, which are systems that are designed to hold people down and give preferential treatment to people. And I'll explain that in a minute and give you some examples. Then there's personally mediated racism where I just am gonna discriminate against you because of who you are ethnically. And, and then obviously institutional racism comes from that perspective. But if institutional is more of a system, a governmental system or in a economic system, housing, et cetera. Um, that favor one group over another. And then there's personally media, me to you individually, which this book is more towards the heart of individuals. And then there's internalized where racism, where I am racist against my own kind or myself, where I have been told so often that I'm less than that I believe it. And then I start talking about and to people who are like me, like the racist does. And I've experienced that personally. It's my, I've seen it in my family, I've seen it in people. And, and that's, that's the horrible, you know. So um, institutional racism are systems, you know. There was a, a practice called redlining where banks would take a red, magic marker and redline around a neighborhood and say, you know, minority neighborhoods say, okay, in this neighborhood, we're either not gonna give loans or we're gonna hike up the rates, which by the way, there was a bank in 2015 that was caught doing this. And you know, the rates are going to be high or higher, or we're not going to loan there. It's going to change all the parameters, not based on qualification, because the people were qualified. It was based on that neighborhood. Um, as you as you can imagine, people it's harder to get loans, the values of the houses don't go up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it impacts generational wealth, it, it, the value of houses, and it keeps people in poverty. Things like that are well documented. I mean, obviously, slavery was institutional racism, but and then you have personally mediated where people just don't like each other. So there's different kinds. This book is more addressing the heart of the individual, and obviously, policies come from people's hearts. But how can we impact someone's heart? Wow. So uh, we've got just a few minutes left, Miles. Let me let's let's move this into the practical side of. What do we do? Again, we're in a nation that's divided. Uh, those of us who are listening, probably the majority of us are Christians. So we believe in Jesus. We love this idea that you're talking about of love your neighbor. We love the idea of honor, like unbelievable. Okay, great. But now we're sitting here going, okay, so what do I do? It, it, whether I'm white, black, brown, Asian, or somewhere in the middle, what, what do I do? A couple of things, get this. <laughs> Agreed, amen, I agree. Um, the greatest commandment, the greatest commandment is to love God with your heart, mind, soul, and love your neighbor as yourself, neighbor. 
That means God said, Jesus said, if you want to get the Bible right, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's a neighbor? Good Samaritan story. Everybody's your neighbor. What if I relabel you something less than neighbor? Then I don't have to love you. And so I would start by relabeling everybody you see as your neighbor, whether it's a white supremacist, whether it's a black athlete that you resent because he's kneeling and he's doing this on the sideline in a football game, uh, whether it's the, the, immig the immigrants coming across the border that you have relabeled something less than neighbor and you don't even know them, that's your outgroup and you already have all these assumptions about them. You have to relabel people neighbor. Now, if, if you relabel them neighbor, uh, back up your social narrative is a story that has shaped how you see the world. Uh, what your family told you, what your kid, your friends, your neighborhood, your high school, um, it develops a prescription through which you see the world. If through your prescription, you see people as less than neighbor, you dehumanize them. And now you can only relate to them through the dehumanized title or label you've given them, stupid, N-word, white this, black this, Mexican this, whatever it is, that you can only relate to them. You can't love them as your neighbor because you just dehumanize them with a less than neighbor label. So I would label everybody neighbor. And, or brother or sister says, that person I love, I have to by law in God's eyes. Number one. Number two, I would um, have every time you have a conversation, you're having a race conversation mm -hmm. because you do see color because God gave us eyes that process color whether you want to or not. You are either affirming what you believe about that type of person or that person is self-disclosing things to you that are challenging your views. I can't tell you how many people have told me, well, you're not really black. What they were really saying was, based on my assumption of black people, you don't fit that description. That's not my problem. That's theirs. Because they had a description based on their out group. Let people disclose to you what they are. Mm. Don't judge them. Now, because you have a social narrative, because you have images and assumptions, lay them aside because they come into your head immediately and say, I'm gonna let this person reveal who they really are instead of me determining based on my limited information. So I would, I would relabel people, I would see people's color, we talked about that, acknowledge and celebrate where they're from and assume that everybody is fearfully and wonderfully and marvelously made. Look for that fearful, wonderful uh, God design in every person because all of us are made in the image of God and the image of God is the same in every single person. Uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the same over there as he is over there. So let me find that in somebody. Let me look for it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Come on, man. That, that gets me fired up. I mean, when I think about people watching this, listening to this, and, and stepping into that conversation, uh, that's, how, that's, how we change, that's how we change our nation, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we, we get policymakers and uh, leaders, people who are – developing institutions, rules and laws. I mean, we need to start with this in mind with everybody's our neighbor. How can we love them? How can we understand the burden of different people's experience and acknowledge it instead of saying everything's the same? Um, I know we talked about, I can't put my on the race. You, get, you can get right-handed golf clubs in any golf shop. You get a right-handed catches mitt in any baseball shop, any, any sport and good store. I'm left-handed. I have to go to five stores. It takes me longer. Yep. But if you're right-handed, you don't even know that. If you're right-handed, you shake with your right hand. I'm left-handed. And you don't even understand the disadvantage of left-handed people. You're completely ignorant to it because you didn't have to think about it. Mm -hmm. and, but it doesn't remove the disadvantage and the extra three steps that left-handed people have to take in certain things. Well, that's called being right privilege. <laughs> yeah. And people think that privilege is, well, I have all this money. No, it just means that you have a, a less... A few or less steps because you are always in your in-group because the society was made for your in-group. And people who are left-handed or people of color just have a couple extra steps because they're in the out-group. And, and people have to realize that just because you're not experiencing those extra steps, just because you can get golf clubs like that doesn't mean I can. Because I can't. Right. <laughs> it's nothing you have to think about. And it doesn't make you a bad person, but it also doesn't remove the disadvantage of the left-handed people. Well, as a, as a guy who golfs left-handed, I completely get your illustration. So I'm like, yes, absolutely. Okay, okay, but, but there are those Miles who go, 
but why can't we all just get over it? Uh, you talk in the book about just world bias. Speak yeah. that for a moment. Just yeah, it, matter of fact, someone told that to me. Why can't you just get over it? Literally said that to me. And I said, you probably spend all your time in your end group. And when you're surrounded by people who give you the benefit of the doubt, when you get people who assume they can get along with you and communicate to you, and that's when you're surrounded by that all the time, everywhere you go, uh, and you feel more confident because you're surrounded by people like you, it's easy to say that because you're right-handed. You don't have those obstacles. A, a, a person said that to me, and I said, it was a, a white person, I said, you should go someplace where you're the only white person. Go to a store, go to a church, go someplace where you're the only white person and answer these questions that I wrote about this in a book. I call it Walk in My Shoes Field Trip. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you felt when you were driving there. Tell me how you felt when you got there. How did people treat you? And what was ironic, I, I asked six people uh, to do this uh, in preparation for the book. Two said no, mm -hmm. they would just not go. And one guy said, I'm not gonna even go to a black church. And he wrote such and he put it, I put it in the book. He said, even in a black church, I feel like I have to leave right away. That's sad. Yeah. And so you're telling me in a black church, you would be nervous. Imagine if you lived and went to work and went to the mall and you were around people who weren't like you. Well, that's people of color's experience every day. And so just world bias is that the world is fair and everybody just gets what they got. Well, if you live in a world that you were the outgroup all the time, then you might understand the other side and not say, just get over it because you're not understanding what hurdle needs to be got over unless you had to jump it. And so, um, uh, you know, and one of the people that went on that field trip, they just, and it's in the book, you know, they were just thinking, uh, you know, how are they going to treat me and what are they thinking about me? And, you know, th that's a lot of stress. That's a lot of brain emotional uh, hurdles you got to go through. It's a lot of assumptions about people. And when you don't have to think about those things ever, of course, it's easy to say, just get over it. But when you're preoccupied with those things mm. and you're always thinking people are thinking the worst of you um, or questioning you or why are they doing, what are they doing here? Uh, then you have a whole different experience in life. Um, and then you can realize how you can't, you know, just saying, just get over it is not that simple. Man, that, did I tell you, that is an incredibly wise man of God. And I'm so thankful that I've had the opportunity to receive from Pastor Miles that kind of wisdom. And so I know you might be wondering like, well, what can you do? What, what, how do you respond to, to today's message? Well, I want to recap the, the three things that Pastor Miles said. Number one, pick up the third option. Uh, I believe it's sold out. The hard hardcover uh, copy is sold out on Amazon. But listen, pick up the digital version. Pick up it on Kindle or whatever you your e-reader and read through the third option. It's an incredible book, and it will it will um, just educate and and teach and empower you to be part of the solution. Uh, number two, I loved how good was that part where he said to practice relabeling people as neighbor. Oh my, that, the first time I heard that, y'all, it blew my mind because isn't that what we do? We, we label somebody something less than neighbor so then we can dehumanize them and we don't have to love them as we love ourselves. That was so good. So practice labeling people as neighbor. And then number three, let them disclose who they really are. Let them reveal. You know, we can, we can come with our predetermined assumptions, but, but allow people in your life to disclose to you what they're all about, who they are, what they like. And, and so I think those three things are incredible. Let me give you just one more uh, suggestion. This week, take some time this week to slow down and care enough to empathize and listen as a friend, as a brother and sister in Christ. And the opportunity that we have, this is why I wanted to do this message this week, is because Friday is a day known as Juneteenth. 
You may not be familiar with it. I understand if you're not, but it's called Juneteenth. That's this Friday, June 19th. And what it is, is it's the celebration of the reading of the Emancipation Proclamation to the final state after the Civil War in Texas. It was read out in Texas. And so it's that celebration. Some people call it America's second Independence Day. And here's the thing about Juneteenth that you may not know about. It was started in the church. The church started this celebration in Texas one year after the Civil War, one year after this was read as a, as a proclamation to, to the state of Texas, the church started celebrating this day. And so this week, slow down. What can you do to educate yourself about this issue? There are all kinds of movies available on different streaming platforms for free. Watch one of those. Watch the 13th. Uh, watch 13, right? Like that's an incredible, watch Selma. What, like educate yourself, okay? Read something from somebody that doesn't look like you, okay? Celebrate diversity. Here's what I want to encourage you to do. This Friday, hey, throw a backyard cookout. One of the things that Juneteenth is all about is all about barbecues, all about neighborhoods, all about, you know, celebrating diversity. So do that. Do if Maybe with your neighbors, maybe with just your family. Uh, plan a special meal with your kids. Talk about diversity. Talk, read the Emancipation Proclamation. And, and, and let your kids know. And then I discovered this, and then we'll, we'll wrap up and pray. Um, red foods are customary for Juneteenth. And so... Red is a symbol of ingenuity, but it's also a symbol of resilience. So whatever you do with your cookout Friday meal, incorporate some red foods and talk to the people around you about what you're celebrating. So let me pray for us. Uh, we'll go into another worship song, and then I'll come back with just a few closing uh, closing. Uh, reminders before we hop off here. Lord, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to receive from Pastor Matt and Pastor Miles. Lord, just two incredibly wise men of God. And I thank you today for their voices. I thank you for their wisdom. I thank you for Pastor Miles taking uh, taking the boldness and, and the courage to speak out on this issue and providing such a wonderful resource for us to glean from in his book. I pray that you bless him today. God, I pray that you open up our ears open up our hearts and close our mouths. Lord, let us hear first, let our hearts be open, and let us speak only uh, after we have slowed down enough to listen. We love you, Jesus, and we love everybody. God, we want to be a church for everybody, every race, both genders. We want to empower everybody to go pursue and display the presence of God. So, Lord, continue to lead us, lead our hearts to be people who are a light to this world, who don't abandon our voice, but speak and lead out with the gospel of Jesus Christ in action, in, in love and celebration in Jesus' name. Come on, let's sing together one more time. Time, and then I'll be back with a few closing uh, closing announcements. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me, and all my days. I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God So my life you have been faithful
Well, hey, uh, thank you for joining us today. I just want to remind you, next Sunday begins our after parties, June 21st and 28th. We're going to meet at Chesapeake City Park at 1130 for a Bring Your Own Lunch fellowship time. It's an after party. We'll do church online and then we'll meet together for some fellowship. We're going to be in shelters six and seven, which are close to the uh, fun forest playground area for the kids. June 21st and 28th. That's next, the next two Sundays. Not today, the next two Sundays after party. We'd love to have you there. Hey, next Monday night, June 22nd at 7.30 p.m., we're going to have a family Zoom call just to update you about a couple of things going on at church with the transition uh, in leadership, but also with our uh, transition towards regathering, what that's going to look like, the information that we have most currently available. And so we we want, to, we want to grab everybody together on that family Zoom call. You'll receive information about that in your email, so be checking for that. Last thing, again, just a reminder, small groups are launching July 12th. Uh, we would love for you, listen, you might be thinking about leading a small group. Summer is a great time to do that because there's all kinds of options. You can lead any kind of group that you want to lead. We just want to empower people to connect with each other during this season. So let us know if you're interested in leading a small group and we'll, uh, we'll get you the information that you need to do that and to do it well. Hey, thank you for being here today. I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Enjoy that time and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night, seven o'clock right on Facebook Live for our weekly prayer times. Y'all have a great Sunday.